I was hesitant in the beginning about getting the vaccine because you hear many different things about different vaccines. And of course you have the influence of the internet and you know, everybody has their, these different opinions about the vaccine. So it's natural and I think it's human to have your doubts about it. But what really changed my mind and shifted, you know, my opinion on the vaccine is I see things are getting better. The numbers are starting to get better. I decided to go ahead and get the vaccine um, to keep everybody safe and really to keep myself motivated and not limiting myself on the places that I can go, you know, the things that I can do, um, which includes teaching and many other things in my public art. So um, I really had to think about that and I really had to think about the things that my family members had gone through. I had a cousin who was on a ventilator for over 30 days um, because of COVID and I just think about her life and I think about other people's lives and that really helped influence my decision on getting the vaccine. Thank you, Jalen. Hi, Kentucky. This is First Lady Brittany Bashir. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Jalen Stewart for sharing her vaccine story. Jalen is an artist and teacher in Louisville, and I want to thank her for rolling up her sleeve for herself, her students, and her community. That is what our teachers are all about. That's why I'm happy to start today's update by giving thanks to those amazing educators as we celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week. Kentucky teachers are remarkable. We've always appreciated them, but I know many of us, Andy and myself included, saw our appreciation grow even more during this past year. From fostering a love of learning with our kids to ensure their needs are cared for in and out of the classroom, the work of our teachers is never ending. It's their dedication and compassion that truly set them apart. On behalf of the entire Commonwealth, thank you. You are making a difference. Also making a difference in our communities are Kentucky's nurses. These healthcare heroes are always there for our people, but this year they went above and beyond during the COVID-19 pandemic. They not only cared for those suffering from the virus, they often stood in place for the loved ones who were separated or held up the iPad for families during unimaginable circumstances. They took personal time out of their regular work hours to volunteer at COVID testing sites. Now they are the driving force and administering the safe and effective vaccines to our people. Today, on Nurses Day, we celebrate you and the work that you do. Finally, I'm excited to invite Kentuckians to join me in supporting an important cause here in Kentucky. This Saturday, May 8th, I will be joining Kroger stores across the Commonwealth to host the annual Shop and Share, a one-day community event benefiting the Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence's 15 regional shelters. From 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. this Saturday, Kentuckians can shop for what they need and then share an item that will be donated to a local domestic violence shelter program. Volunteers will be on site at many Kroger locations to share the program shopping list, or Kentuckians can access a mobile list via the shop and share QR codes located throughout the store. All donations directly help domestic violence programs that provide life-saving shelter and supportive services to women, men, and children in Kentucky during their times of need. Over the past 11 years, more than $5 million in goods and monetary donations have been raised. This year, I'm excited to help grow that support so we can make a difference in the lives of those who need us most. I hope to see you there, and now I will pass it off to Andy. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you to a wonderful uh, First Lady. Uh, it's an amazing shop and share program. Pretty neat to see started uh, by my mom, uh, continuing through multiple administrations. Uh, make sure that you stop in to a Kroger uh, this weekend on Saturday um, and, and donate what you can. All right. So today we've got a lot of news, uh, but it's good news. 
I'd like to start by congratulating uh, Packard Products, Packard Parts for breaking ground on a new 260,000 square foot parts distribution center in Louisville. This new location is in Louisville, Louisville's Riverport Authority's Phase 5 development. It will create 80 full-time jobs with an average hourly wage of $23.50, including benefits. The project will allow the company to better serve the growing market for light, medium, and heavy-duty trucks under the Kenworth, Peterbilt, and DAF names, as well as aftermarket products. This is a company with international reach, with an extensive dealer network of more than 2,200 locations and 18 additional parts distribution centers across four continents. Kentucky's strength in the automotive sector is something we should all be proud of, and companies like this continuing to locate in Kentucky just continue to help us uh, with, with that sector and to increase our advantages. This new operation is going to be a great fit within an industry that already includes over 500 facilities employing over 100,000 Kentuckians. I want to say thank you to Pack Our Parts for locating in Kentucky, and congratulations to Louisville and Jefferson County as another great project helps the community move forward. That's exciting. We're having one, two, three of these announcements just about every day. As I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, our economy is not only heating up, it's starting to break records. Next, we're celebrating a $21.6 million federal grant to help Kentuckians who are in jeopardy of losing their job and income after suffering health issues, including those related to COVID-19. Kentucky is one of only five states to receive the second phase of the U.S. Department of Labor's Retain Grant, which will expand Kentucky's ability to keep people employed as they recover from unexpected injuries or illnesses. This funding includes measures to address physical health issues as well as mental health issues. I congratulate the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation at the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet for their efforts over the past two years with the first phase of the Retain Grant funding. In 2018, they began with the $3.5 million pilot program and over the past two years have helped countless Kentucky families during an incredibly difficult time. With the phase two funding, they're going to be able to expand the program to serve up to 3,000 Kentucky families. I'd also like to thank the University of Kentucky and the Human Development Institute for their critical partnership in administering this program to keep Kentuckians working and our economy strong. All right, this next part is really really exciting. Today, we have even more great economic news to share about particularly sales tax revenue in the Commonwealth, something that directly shows how much our people are out, how much they're spending, uh, and how strong our economy is or how hot it is getting. This news is coming quickly on the heels of some other recent economic indicators that show clearly that our efforts to safeguard our people how we've handled this pandemic and protect the livelihoods of Kentuckians are paying off as our momentum is building and outstripping other parts of our nation. First off, even while we waged war against COVID-19 these past 14 months, we never stopped working to create the jobs of the future. We announced 233 new or expansion projects last year. Those projects are expected to create 8,000 jobs with one of the highest hourly wages in years. That was all done during the pandemic. Last month, we were recognized for that work by uh, one of the top industry publications, Site Selection Magazine. They validated our hard work, and they rank Kentucky at the very top of our region, South Central Region for Economic Development. And they ranked us third nationally per capita in 2020 projects. That's us, Kentucky, number three nationally, even in the midst of a pandemic. Then, just yesterday, we learned that Fitch's Ratings, that's one of the nation's big three credit rating agencies, has upgraded its view of Kentucky's financial outlook. Fitch said it boosted its rating uh, because of a number of things. First, our strong economic recovery. Those were their words. They talked about how our unemployment was low and our employment picking up compared to other states. They talked about our strong fiscal management. They talked about how we've been paying our pension obligations. Uh, they, they, they even talked about how we now have the largest rainy day fund in our history, which is about to get larger, 
even during the pressures posed by the pandemics. Uh, and it talked about how our recovery is running ahead of the national economic pace. Fitch's upgrade is hugely consequential, both in terms of our ability to finance projects and in the clear message it sends to the world that folks, we are doing this right. That while others have struggled for different reasons, how they've managed the pandemic, what's going on, we are doing this right. So if that wasn't proof enough, that Kentucky's economy is about to surge ahead in a remarkable way. Earlier today, we received some news that was so good, I had to go ahead and talk to you about it today, even though it's officially coming out tomorrow. This morning, I received news that preliminary data shows April 2021 logged record-breaking gains in sales and motor vehicle usage taxes. Sales tax receipts for this April weren't just the best since the pandemic started, they were the best that we have ever seen. April sales tax hit $486.5 million. That is an all-time monthly high. Again, not just a record since the pandemic took hold, but better than any April in our history in the Commonwealth, meaning more people were out, more people were able to purchase goods, more people were feeling good about our economy, more people were in retail, more people were in restaurants, more people were everywhere that you pay sales tax, which is a direct indicator of how much activity is going on in our economy. This was a record. That all comes on the heels of our last projection that we're going to end this fiscal year with more than a $580 million surplus while other states have floundered. That we're going to end up with over a billion dollars in our rainy day fund, more than ever in the history of our Commonwealth, ever, by both raw dollars and by percentage. So folks, this is what happens when you stop the politicking, when you push out the noise, and when you just work to do the right things for our people, when we value their lives, when we try to make measured decisions, and when we understand that a pandemic is no time for ambition, it's just the time that we do the very best we can for our people every single day. I told you I was done with politics and I'd make the best decisions we could for our Commonwealth. Let me tell you, not only do we have fewer deaths per capita than just about every state in our country, not only are our cases lower in many ways than just about every state in the country, but our economy is taking off better than just about every state in the country. And hey, we just held the largest sporting event uh, since the COVID pandemic started. We are doing this right. And I will tell you from each and every economic development prospect that comes in, one of the reasons they're looking at Kentucky is how we've done this. That these businesses, manufacturing and others have stayed open while we have worked really hard to keep their employees healthy when they are outside of work so that they are not bringing that pandemic in. We have been viewed as a national leader. That's these business leaders' words, not mine. One of the things that's gotten us here is we have been measured. We have not been knee-jerk. We have not uh, bowed to pressure. Uh, we have been measured. We have eased into restrictions. We have eased out of them. We have adjusted based on what's going on with the virus, listening to the best science available. And so that's what we are going to continue to do. But listen, anyone who suggests our economy is not open, we just had the best sales tax month for an April ever in our history. All right. So with that, um, obviously, I've been talking about this 2.5 million uh, vaccination goal, uh, but I think we went back and for seven straight press conferences, I have said, yes, we will uh, be easing restrictions as we move towards that goal. I know it hadn't gotten out there, but we've been saying it over and over and over. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about that so we can give uh, certain businesses enough runway to be ready. So as of today, more than 1.8 million Kentuckians have received at least their first shot of hope. That's allowed us to already start safely easing public restrictions over the past two months. 
in March, we increased our capacity to 60% for just about everything under 1,000 people. We also announced childcare facilities could return to traditional classroom sizes. We were able to ease our mask mandate, and uh, especially for outdoor activities, uh, and take a number uh, of steps. The first week in April, all Kentuckians 16 and older became eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine. As more Kentuckians got vaccinated, we've been able to lift even more restrictions. We've simplified our healthy at work minimum requirement list, and it now applies to all businesses. At this point, only a few industries have additional public health requirements specific to them. Like I mentioned, we lifted the statewide mask mandate for events and venues where Kentuckians are outside with 1,000 or fewer people. Today, because more Kentuckians have continued to get their shot of hope, I will be announcing a plan to further reduce restrictions. And again, we're going to do it step by step like we have always done it. First, May is incredibly important. It's the last full month our kids are in school. And them finishing out school needs to be our number one priority. It's why we prioritize vaccinating our teachers first. And whether it's federally or here, we've always said we have got to put the needs of those kids in front of us. Recently, we have seen two school districts where either the whole district or part of the district has had to go back virtual because of the spread of COVID. Uh, one is the Flemingsburg school district. Uh, the other is Boyd County with a few of their schools. Let me first of all say they're doing the right thing. They haven't done anything wrong. They are just unfortunately the school districts that show that COVID is not done with us. And we have to make sure we continue sacrificing a little bit longer so that our kids can get through school. And I get that we hear folks say, but now that everybody can get the vaccine, why can't we just do X or Y? Everybody can't get the vaccine. Only people 16 and up can get the vaccine. My kids, your kids, and many others, kids that are in these schools still don't have that opportunity. So our next loosening is going to occur on May 28th. That's the beginning of, of the long uh, holiday um, Memorial Day uh, weekend. Uh, it gives us the time to make sure we get through these last weeks of school, yet also gives notice uh, to those that would be hosting folks, opening pools, if it's a big uh, restaurant or retail weekend. So starting Friday, May 28th, all events, indoors and outdoors, with under 1,000 people, that's the same group we had increased to 60%, can now be held at 75% capacity. Businesses and venues that cater to fewer than 1,000 people, again, will be open to 75% capacity. That includes retail, hair salons, restaurants, movie theaters, gyms. It also includes weddings, memorial services, all of those activities that will be under 1,000. In addition, starting on the 28th, May 28th, indoor and outdoor events with more than 1,000 people will be moved up to 60% capacity. Listen, we're talking uh, uh, one more change. This is being made today. Those two capacity changes are May 28th. But beginning today, as you all uh, remember, we were able to, to ease our, our mask mandate, not just for the outdoor events, but when uh, a group, a small group of fully vaccinated individuals were indoor at a gathering, um, the mask mandate no longer applied. Today, we're clarifying that that is true both for private gatherings and for business. Small groups where 100% of people are fully vaccinated, meaning they've gotten either Johnson & Johnson or both shots of the others in two weeks, the mask mandate will no longer apply to them even though they are indoors, but has to be 100% vaccinated. That's what the CDC is saying, but we're able to ease it a little bit for those business meetings where right now people doing it right even though they're 100% vaccinated or sitting around wearing a mask. I appreciate what you're doing. It set a good example, but um, I'm glad we're able to provide some more relief uh, today. So again, we are at a better place than just about any other state can claim, both in how we've protected one another, 
uh, as well as where our economy is and where our economy is going. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, the numbers prove it. The rating agencies prove it. The surplus we're going to have in our budget proves it. Every economic indicator is showing we are really moving in the right direction. All right, so people might say, what's the next step? Or what are we waiting for until we can give the next step? The next thing that we are looking at is when, um, specifically Pfizer, is going to be authorized for 12 to 15-year-olds. That looks like it's going to occur next week. Once that happens, uh, we'll be looking at a specific time period um, that will allow those individuals to get vaccinated. And we can look at, uh, at, at the point when that's occurred, uh, hopefully a full uh, easing of all capacity restrictions. So this is the next part that we're looking at. We want to see how it comes out next week, but we will have more news for you then. Remember, this is when just about everybody can get vaccinated. Let's not leave our kids out of these conversations. Uh, let's make sure that they are eligible as well. And I also just want to uh, give a reminder that the virus isn't done with us. You know, we've, we've seen, we've learned so much about human psychology through the course of, of this pandemic. I certainly have. What we've seen is there are certain moments that are almost imprinted upon us. The beginning of summer is one. The traditional beginning of the school year is another. The holidays um, are another, uh, where we start itching even more than normal for normalcy, um, to, to be able to do what we love to, to, to do. And I know we're, we're at that point again. Uh, we've we're so much further along, though, in our battle against this virus. The vaccines are here, which is great. But let's just remember, a deadly virus is still out there. Take India. Uh, India is tragic. You know, what it ha what's happened in the United States is tragic. But India right now, hospitals overrun, uh, crematoriums, uh, not enough oxygen, sick people taking care of sick people because nobody else is there. And us in, in the world trying to figure out the death toll through thermal imaging of, um, of, of the crematoriums. It is, um, I mean, 300,000 plus cases a day. Um, India had been in a good place, and this is where they are now. So let's make sure we, we don't stop respecting how deadly and how difficult this virus can be. Now, we're also seeing uh, increases in certain areas inside the United States, uh, cases in Arizona, are, are climbing. Uh, Washington, Hawaii, Arkansas, Oregon, others are, are seeing it. So we are not out of the woods. But folks, we're getting so close. And if we can just, again, have a little patience, 75% is huge capacity. It's almost everything. But if you can just give me a little patience, we're coming up to a time when we're going to be able to fully get out of this. CDC is now uh, projecting a sharp decline in COVID cases in the U.S. by July. Listen, I hope that we'll be fully done with any capacity restrictions and all by July. That's actually my, my expectation. Um, but this is good news. And again, it shows we don't have to be patient uh, for that much longer. But we do have to finish our work and protect the people uh, around us. Uh, with that, um, Dr. Stack is going to talk about a couple of different topics um, about our switch in our vaccine finder uh, starting next week to the federal system, which is uh, now uh, outpacing our, our state ability just from an IT aspect and can help you search um, if you only qualify, say, for Pfizer. If you are 16, in, uh, 18 and uh, 17, 16, it, it helps you search directly for that. I've also asked him to talk about a a little bit of the, the disinformation that's out there on fertility uh, and also what it'll mean if the FDA says this vaccine is safe for 12 to 15 year olds. We will then give the, the vaccine report and then give today's COVID report. Dr. Stack. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. So, the federal government really has invested quite a lot of time and effort and resources into getting their data systems progressively better, and we're grateful for that. We are now at the point where we'll change on Monday to using vaccines.gov. You can look at this now. We'll walk through it more on Monday when we talk about it, and we'll have some images to show it to you. 
If you go to vaccines.gov and you click on the um, little button at the top, it'll let you enter your zip code. When you enter your zip code, it'll show you all the locations nearby to you that have vaccine available where you can get vaccinated. Additionally, it lets you pick which type of vaccine. This is something we have hoped for uh, for a long time, or at least for a long time since we started vaccinating in December, where we wanted people to be able to have choice. Uh, previously, we didn't have enough vaccine for people to have choice. Now, for the most part, there's enough vaccine available that people can have choice. You'll be able to pick, do you want Pfizer or Moderna or J&J &J or some combination of those? And it will show you the locations that have those inventories available for you. The other thing you can do, since we're such a mobile society, you can use your mobile phone and you can text your zip code to uh, a number. And when you do that, it will send back to you three locations close to you that have vaccine available. So for English speakers, you can text to GETVAX, that's G-E-T-V-A-X, all together. The number for that is 438-829. So that's 438-829. So if you put in your zip code uh, and send a message to that, GETVAX, you will get back, and I did it twice here while I was uh, listening to the governor, you'll get back three pharmacies uh, or other locations. Uh, when I did it in Lexington, it showed the University of Kentucky and it showed two other pharmacies that were close to the zip code I entered where they have vaccine available and I think the phone number there for you to be able to call them. The other option for Spanish speakers is you can put in Baguna, so V-A-C-U-N-A. -A. If you text to that, and the number for that is 822 862. If you text to that number, you'll get back with Spanish language, three locations close to that zip code. So on Monday, what we'll do is we'll demonstrate, hopefully with a little video, but definitely with some visuals, what that website looks like. And we'll replace the map we have on our website with that federal site. We've been working as well with the vaccine locations throughout the state. I talked with them this Wednesday and we'll continue to message with them to make sure they're updating their inventory daily so that that's as accurate as can be across the Commonwealth. So I think we're grateful to the federal government for the continued improvements they make. There are two other points I'd like to make. Um, uh, the first one being about the data and the next one being about the uh, vaccine and some of the myths and uh, unfortunately harmful misinformation that's being spread about some of them. The first is about the data. Uh, this has been one heck of a journey over the last 14 months or so. We have had to build systems from scratch for problems that didn't previously exist and use existing systems to do things they were never intended or envisioned to do, either for the specific type of work or the pace of which and volume at which they've had to operate. Uh, that holds true now for the vaccine deployment. And we've already said the federal uh, data systems in Tiberius, uh, which is the big federal data system, are getting progressively better, enabling us to announce, like we did on Monday, that we were moving our data polls for every uh, data set we were able to for the vaccine project from the federal sources. Despite all of our best efforts, we cannot get all of the numbers to completely align because the software and the computers use different algorithms, different processes, and sometimes even different subsets of census data. And those little small changes don't really make a material difference for what we're doing to manage our response but if people are looking from data set to data set, you're going to see variances of a couple percentage points sometimes. So I'll give you an example. If you look on the federal website today, it shows that in Kentucky, we have immunized 81% of the population 65 and older. When we look at the data set we pull, the number we get is a little over 79%. So again, somewhere probably truth lies in the middle. And so it's about 80% of the population who's 65 or older. Those little variances, we try to disclaim as much as we can when we publish the data where we are aware of those. Uh, when we find new ones, we try to be transparent about that. And we're just doing the best we can to give actionable information to people as quickly as we can produce it and as reliably as we're able to produce it. Um, the final thing, I'm gonna respond to, to the governor's request to talk about some of the harmful myths and misunderstandings that are propagated. All three of these vaccines that you have access to now, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer have been rigorously studied. The, the shortening of the, the design and development phase had to do with shortening the commercial uh, life cycle of things where the finance risk and 
uh, certain other processes that would normally just take time in, in the normal bureaucracy, if you will, were, were markedly shortened. They still studied all these vaccines in 30 to 40,000 or more people. And as I stand here today, there's more than 110 or 120 million Americans who have been vaccinated. And we are actively tracking that data. The CDC, through its adverse uh, events reporting system, is tracking that data. And I think a wonderful example of how closely they're following it is that they were able to find when they only had uh, a handful of people who had had an experience with the J&J &J vaccine, they were able to find that so quickly, pause the use of the vaccine, explore it, and then provide additional information so people can be informed. One of the myths that is absolutely unfounded, none of these vaccines have any impact. There's been no shown impact on women's fertility. That is a falsehood and we have not found any information to support that. The other thing, women who are pregnant are able to get vaccinated. And in fact, that's recommended as a way to reduce their risk because the risk of the disease when you're pregnant is greater. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. I just continue to encourage you, go to trustworthy sites like cdc.gov or kycovid19.gov. Go to those type of locations where we're giving you information that is reliable and from the CDC and the FDA. And we update that is, um, as often as important changes occur, and we'll keep on trying to do that so you can make a properly informed decision. As the children, hopefully next week, are able to have access to vaccine, so the 12 and older, it is really important, it's really important that you take advantage of that opportunity. We're working with um, local health departments. We've discussed with vaccine uh, administration sites across the state. Uh, we're also going to make available uh, to the schools through some announcements in the next couple of days and next week when I talk with the superintendents, access to the wild health uh, opportunity for them to do vaccine clinics on site at schools. I hope you'll please consider uh, taking advantage of this wonderfully protective tool to help keep your family, your loved ones, and the rest of the community safe. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to putting as much of this behind us as possible and getting on with our lives uh, progressively more and more as the governor's already announced. So thank you very much, and Governor. All right, uh, so uh, vaccine update. Today, um, 1,842,521 unique persons have been vaccinated in Kentucky. Um, when we look at uh, Kentuckians out of state and we look at how many of of those we vaccinated are in state right now, we believe 1,855,111 Kentuckians have now been vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, when we look at, at age group breakdowns, um, it, almost 80% of those 65 years and older vaccinated, that is wonderful. 57% of those 50 to 64, good, but we need to be better. Um, 40 to 49 years, 43%. That's my group. We can do better too. And then when you get from uh, 18 to, to 39, that's uh, really less than a third. So uh, again, we need to do better there. In positive news, 52% of, of the population that is eligible to be vaccinated has now been vaccinated. It looks like 16 and 17-year-olds are uh, definitely taking advantage of being able to get uh, vaccinated. Um, second doses, we're seeing um, a pretty good take up on those. Uh, there are some folks that, that haven't been getting their second dose, but we're, we think we're doing pretty well um, on that side. Uh, folks, we really do need more people to get vaccinated, though. Uh, we've got plenty of vaccine out there, and, and there will be a point where, where we turn the, the, the corner and um, you're going to need to be vaccinated at that point you know, to be safe. Uh, it not only protects you, it not only nearly eliminates death uh, and, and serious illness from this virus, it does appear to reduce the ability that you would spread it to loved ones or to other people. So please treat your neighbor as yourself, get vaccinated to protect everybody around you. Uh, when we look at demographic breakdowns, uh, I think we were able to to, to provide most of that gender, still 50% female, 42% male in Kentucky. I think that, that that's a little different than what we're seeing in some other states. Um, uh, uh, when we look at ethnicity, 2.71% Hispanic, 97.29% non-Hispanic. 
We look at the breakdown of race, 83.76% white, 5.8% black or African-American. That is ticked up. Again, not as much as we want, but we do have 8.5% of other. Again, much higher than that, that makes up in the census. And, and you know, we're, we're continuing to try to delve into that piece. I'm not sure we'll ever get all the information we need uh, to understand true percentages that are, that are out there. Today's uh, COVID update, 655 new cases of COVID-19. Uh, while our days have been a little different, we seem to be tracking last week pretty closely. We'll see what happens the rest of the week. Positivity rate, though, seems to be creeping up a little bit day by day, 3.51%. We're going to hope that we see that uh, starting to go down. Uh, six total deaths, five from the, the local health departments, the regular uh, method, one uh, from our audit. Um, those include a 79-year-old man from Breckenridge County, a 50-year-old man from, and that was a an April death, a 50-year-old man from Lawrence County, that's a May death, a 75-year-old woman from McCreary County, that's an April death. Again, this is, our audit has helped us catch up on those that are taking longer to get from local health departments. We have caught through the audit. Um, and so most of these are more recent. A 49-year-old woman from Marion County, an April death. Here's one of the older ones, an 88-year-old woman from Ohio County, that is a November death. And then from our audit, uh, an 86-year-old man from Jefferson County. Uh, a number of these today are in uh, long-term care. Uh, two are historic. Um, there's three total from long-term care, one in November, one in December, but also uh, one in uh, April. As we look at incident rate, again, those 49 years and younger, making up the majority of our cases, almost twice as many cases as 50 and older. Um, but in good news on the congregate care side, remember how we used to have 68, 69% of all deaths being people in congregate care? It's now down to 36.58%. Why? Because just about everybody in congregate care has been vaccinated compared to the rest of the population. Uh, variants of concern in Kentucky, again, continue to increase, 492 uh, total identified variants of concern. We know there are a ton more than that, but just the increase in the ones we're identifying uh, should suggest to you the B117 is now the dominant variant in Kentucky with 441 of those 492. Uh, continue to see a few more cases in long-term care than we would like. We really need to get everybody who hasn't been vaccinated in long-term care vaccinated. 10 new residents testing positive, four new staff, five new deaths, though um, certainly a number of those are historic. All right, with that, we'll turn it over to Amy Cubbage for a UI update, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Governor. Just a few short updates today. First is um, an announcement about our Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program. Um, the Governor has spoken recently about um, President Biden's major disaster declaration for nine counties where there was severe flooding. Um, if you are an individual in one of the counties, Breathitt, Clay, Estill, Floyd, Johnson, Lee, McGoffin, Martin, or Powell County, and you became unemployed or you were self-employed and had work interrupted as a result of the flooding um, between February 27th and March 14th, you can apply for disaster unemployment assistance through the Office of Unemployment. Um, the first step that you need to do that would be helpful is if you could go ahead and try to file an initial UI claim through the Kentucky Career Center website. But then there will be in-person assistance only for the DUA claimants at the Lloyd M. Hall Community Center at 68 South Church Center in Salyersville. There will be staff there to assist you with your DUA applications from 9 to 5 on May 11th through the 13th and again on May 18th through the 20th. And again, this is only for people who were affected by the disaster. This is not for standard UI assistance. 
Um, the deadline to apply for this assistance from those nine counties is June 5th, and this information will also be posted on the Career Center website and will also be put out in a few press releases. I know we had really, um, announced a couple of weeks ago that the work search requirement is being reinstated. Just a reminder that that starts again May 9th, which is this Sunday. Um, as a reminder, you're required to seek suitable full-time employment and report at least one job contact per week. Um, please keep a record of your contacts because you will have to put that in when you make your benefit requests. That's going to include the job you applied for, the name and title of who you contacted at that job, and the name of the employer. Um, you're going to have a reasonable amount of time to find work comparable in pay and skill level. Um, after a reasonable amount of time, you may be requested to expand your search out. Um, you won't be required to conduct that search if you're in a trade union that finds work for you. You're a student in a training program. You have a recall date within 12 weeks, or you file, or you were um, part of a mass claim filed by your employer. We've had some questions about PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. If you are a PUA claimant, you are required to look for work, but of course it has to be suitable and will be dependent on the reason that you are claiming PUA. Um, when you request your benefits, the system will start to walk you through the review process and show you how to put that information in. And we'll have more information, including FAQs, on the kcc.ky.gov website. Um, just a reminder, our call center is open. Um, we've made over um, 12,000 in-person UI appointments at the career centers and made 2,300 calls at our call center. Um, if you do need assistance, you can call 502-564-2900. And with that, I wish every all of the other moms out there a happy Mother's Day this weekend and turn it back over to the governor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Amy mentioned Mother's Day before I did. Uh, sorry, Jane. Uh, two things. Number one, um, the first thing, uh, the number one thing I'm hearing from employers right now is they got jobs. They're ready. They're raising their pay. Um, so folks, get vaccinated and a career is waiting for you out there. More opportunity right now than just about everybody, just about any time before. And now's the time. Now's the time. You get that vaccine, you're safe. Kids are back in school. Daycare is, is open again and child care. Now is, is the time. With our economy taking off, we want you to be a part of this. Second thing is she mentioned the flooding and what had become uh, available there. We got a really good update from FEMA. As you know, we had applied for counties to get public assistance, think infrastructure, uh, damage to, to that and, and you know, other, other uh, uh, publicly owned parts of, of a county. We'd also applied for individual assistance. Now, um, counties had to reach a threshold to get approved. Some of them, when we got our first list of approved counties, hadn't reached it yet, but now has. So FEMA has now approved for public assistance the following additional counties for that major flooding event. Bell, Callaway, Clark, Edmondson, Graves, Harlan, Leslie, Fletcher, Menifee, Owsley, Perry, Pulaski, Union, and Whitley counties. There are also two last time that got, applied, uh, that got approved for individual assistance, which is really rare, but didn't have the documentation in for public assistance. They now do and they have been granted it, and that is Clay and Estill counties. As of yet, we haven't seen any new approvals for individual assistance outside of the nine counties thus far approved, but a lot of good news from the federal government, um, their willingness to help uh, with us after that flooding event. All right, so a lot of different news. I know we've got a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to keep answers short. We'll start with Sue, Stu Johnson from WEKU. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Um, you uh, again mentioned today about the hope to lift all restrictions by midsummer. You mentioned that bringing on the 12 to 15 year olds uh, for shots will help in that regard. Still, as a state, we're sitting at a, about at about 1.8 million 
and you had a, a mention a goal of 2.5 million uh, vaccinated. Do you think it could be the end of the year or into next year before we as a state would reach that mark? Uh, I don't know when we'll reach the mark, but uh, we'll certainly uh, lift capacity restrictions uh, this summer. Um, it, it, we want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity uh, to get vaccinated. I want to see what happens with the 12 to 15 year olds and give them a reasonable time to get vaccinated. We're already lifted capacity to 75%, right? We're three quarters of the way there. So we'll just be looking at those additional opportunities for folks to get vaccinated. And, and Stu, think about all the extra people that did not qualify, could not get the shot if they wanted to, uh, that will be able to when the FDA approves Pfizer for 12 through 15 year olds. Karen Zarr from WUKY. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Rachel. Uh, Governor, how do you plan to get the message to parents and guardians who are apprehensive, even if they've gotten the vaccine, about giving this to their children? And then a second question, if Dr. Stock has time, uh, do we have any new information on where the studies are on booster shots? Thank you. So in, in communicating uh, good information to parents, guardians, and kids, certainly pediatricians, uh, uh, school systems, local health departments, uh, all of those connections mainly that, that are related to health. And we're gonna put out as, as much information as we can in ways that, that people can absorb. But if the FDA approves it, it is safe. Uh, we believe it'll be safe. Uh, my son will turn 12. Um, in June, and he's ready to get vaccinated. And as long as it is approved, I believe it's safe. I'll take my son, and I would never, ever do that unless I knew uh, that it was safe. Um, we're still waiting on really more news on on boosters. Moderna had some new information that they think a booster can uh, really help uh, against variants. Now, they also say if you get both shots, you need to go back and get your second shot. Pfizer and Moderna, you're in a much better place uh, against those those variants, but we're still waiting. I mean, we still haven't seen somebody who's been vaccinated uh, lose a lot of their antibodies yet. We haven't seen how long that that it'll truly last, and and that's something we're all waiting to see. But but uh, the longer it goes before they 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 start seeing that, the better for all of us. Uh, but when you think about boosters, also think about how widespread now um, the the vaccination network is. It'd be as easy as going into your pharmacy when you're going for something else and going into the grocery store and, and getting that done. Tom Latek from Kentucky Today. Good afternoon, Governor. And uh, I've, I've got a couple if I can throw at you here. Uh, for, one for you, one for Dr. Speck. Uh, first of all, um, now that more uh, vaccinations have been done at state prisons, had, do you have any kind of timetable on when you may allow uh, people to start visiting them? And then secondly, and this is a, a more of a Dr. Stack question, um, earlier in the pandemic, it was uh, don't if, for the two shot vaccines, don't mix Pfizer and Moderna. But I saw something on some national source here not too long ago that they're actually trying to encourage that, that it may help with the variants. And I'm wondering if Dr. Stack has anything to uh, comment on that. Okay, um, uh, he, he'll come up and comment uh, on that. Uh, what was the first question? Oh, uh, prison visitation. Um, remember, we weren't able to get to the number we needed to do that because of the Johnson & Johnson pause. Now that it's being given again, I believe the uptake is significant enough when we reach that threshold, which I think was 80%, which we all think we're gonna reach with um, uh, our Kentuckians who are incarcerated. Uh, vaccinated individuals will be able to visit uh, vaccinated um, incarcerated Kentuckians, and I will check on where we are at that number. Dr. Stack. Uh, thank you. And thanks for the question about uh, vaccine type and the second dose. So the first message I'd like to leave is it is very important you get the second dose, that you don't have the same strength of protection. You probably don't have the same length of protection if you just get the first dose of a two-dose vaccine. So a study that came out last week, a CDC uh, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, uh, I believe showed that it's over 90% protective for people over 65 for death and, and hospitalization. 
if you get two doses of the vaccine, it is only 65% effective in protecting you against hospitalization if you get only one dose. So please go back and get your second dose. The other thing is it's theoretical about whether there's any benefit to get one vaccine then jump to another. There's not research trials that have proven that. And what we've continued to say all along is people should take confidence in the safety of the vaccines because we're using science to test them and to provide you that assurance and to track that they stay safe. Um, mixing and matching vaccines right now is theoretical. It's not been studied and it's not been proven yet. And so for right now, I would recommend you do not do that. Go back and get the second dose of the same vaccine. And if the science later shows otherwise, then we'll update you on that when we reach that point. Thank you. Thank you. So my translation is don't believe the internet. Catherine Collins at WLEX. Hi, Governor, a couple questions for you. Um, on the announcement today with seeing numbers, uh, vaccine numbers continue to stagnate. Can you explain the reasoning behind making this announcement today and why you believe it's the right step? And also um, earlier this week, UK announced they will be closing their Kroger Field vaccine site soon. Is there a plan to close uh, state mass vaccination sites? Uh, yes, uh, most of the state's mass, mass vac vaccination sites are closing. Uh, we'll close in the next couple of weeks, but the same amount of vaccine is available now in more locations. Uh, what we have seen is that people are more willing now to get their vaccines at places they would normally be, grocery stores, um, Walmarts, uh, drug stores. Uh, those are the places that, that, that we're pushing it out to, and there are more now than, than ever before. Um, on... Um, on, on being able to, to increase capacity, uh, again, we're, we're watching a number of things. We're watching the, the vaccination number. We're also uh, watching our case numbers, our positivity rate, and where it's going. Uh, we also have some studies from the CDC about what they expect to see later in the summer. Uh, and the overall risk for what we can and can't do decreases at the end of May because our kids have gotten through uh, school. Uh, to me and, and to this administration, that's a big piece of it because we pledged that we would get our kids back in school and keep them in school until the end of the year. Uh, with the summer starting, with more things being outdoors, uh, we believe that we can loosen. And, and listen, I get the people are itching. And, and the best we can do is the best we can do. And that's having the right rules in place um, with the maximum number of people who, who will follow them. We're very close to the end of this. It looks like we'll we'll get to immunity, not just through vaccines, but also through those that have had the virus, and we'll get the natural uh, immunity. We just want to make sure we can take care of everybody over here uh, through our health care capacity. Chad Hedrick from WKYT. Hi, Governor. I know in, in the past you've mentioned, you know, exploring some incentives for people getting vaccinated, obviously raising the capacity limits. That's That's one in itself, but you know, for example, I, the West Virginia's governor announcing these $100 savings bonds for residents who get vaccinated. Where are we in terms of looking at some kind of an initiative or incentive for people mm -hmm. uh, to get the vaccine? Well, first, we've got a number of incentives that are being offered, uh, especially by employers that are out there. You have everything from a bonus that Kroger gives to its employees uh, to other opportunities being offered by all types of businesses across Kentucky. Um, Cincinnati Reds in Northern Kentucky have offered free tickets. Uh, uh, Louisville uh, Racing FC, the, the uh, top professional um, uh, level sport in, in Kentucky, uh, women's professional soccer has offered uh, free tickets as well. I believe it is Monday that you're going to hear about uh, a partnership uh, that'll be announced that that contains um, uh, one of our statewide uh, incentives. And then you're going to hear uh, about another one the, the next week, which one of our really good corporate partners that is vaccinating people are going to be providing. Uh, we have certain state laws that do bar us from doing things primarily with bars that other states are are doing. Uh, but listen, asking asking those that that want capacity to increase even more to offer little incentives is just trying to make them a part uh, of the effort. Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News. Um, hi, Governor. Um, I have a couple questions today as well. 
So Rand Paul today at the university, I'm not sure who was today, said at UK today. Oh, you can't? Let me see if I'm. Yes, I can. I can. We're all good. Oh, so Rand Paul said at UK today that um, you need to be sending vaccines to primary care physicians and offices. Is this already being done or is there a plan to do yes. that? A second? It, it, yes, it is being done. Yeah, go, go with your next one and I'll hit your first one. All right, I'm sneaking two in. So, and then right. before that, um, the, C- the CDC, um, of course, said in July they're expecting that decline, but they're also expecting an early summer surge, right when you're uh, lifting some capacities. Have you considered that? Are you worried about it? And then the third one is, do you have any specific response to Ryan Quarles' statement? I did it. I snuck uh, it in. Yeah, on the last one, no. I'm not playing politics. I'm not looking at the next election. I'm trying to save lives doing the best that I can. I believe this is a time to be selfless. I believe this is a time to spend um, our opportunity, our voice to uh, make sure that we're encouraging people to get vaccinated and to put the the needs of the people of Kentucky and their health and safety above everything else. Uh, As you can see, we have done better in fighting this pandemic than just about any other state in terms of cases, in terms of of deaths and now in terms of uh, economic rebound and and vitality. Having the best April sales tax month ever in our history uh, just shows that. So, you know, let's, let's, let's operate on real facts, but let's push all the goofiness of something that's supposed to occur in 2023 off until 2023 and not, 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 not use a pandemic um, uh, for it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on 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 fighting the 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 pandemic. All right, now guys, help me with the the. Or, oh, um, uh, Rand Paul's comment: We are are we are already getting it in primary care doctors' um, offices, and we're expanding that program. The challenge, and everybody ought to know this when they're talking about vaccine distributions, is once you pierce the vial, you got to use within a period of time everything in that vial. Now, a primary care doctor might not see 10 full patients in a day, especially if they're doing, you know, the full physicals that are there. Some people practice on their own, some with others. Some will have three people come in that are not vaccinated yet, but everybody else that comes in that day are vaccinated. And so the challenge there is the potential amount of waste. Now, the White House has has told us now that a certain amount of waste is acceptable, uh, but but when it comes in a 10 or a 15 dose file, it, it presents a, a real challenge uh, to primary care physicians. And they have voiced that to us. Uh, but this new flexibility we're, we're being given help us do more. Now, we have pushed for single dose um, uh, vials, single dose uh, shots in, in the syringe. And, and I hope that Senator Paul will, will push for that as well in, in Washington. Okay. I think I got at least two of those. Um, Sarah Ladd from the Courier Journal. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a report that a California bar was selling fake vaccine cards. And I want to ask, is there any indication or concern that that's happened or is happening here in Kentucky? Thanks so much. I haven't seen any evidence that it's happening directly in Kentucky, but Sarah, if it's happened anywhere else, somebody is on the internet trying to do it and trying to to scam people. So the more that we can uh, get the word out that unless you're getting it from a a, a healthcare provider, uh, it's a scam, and and that you know there's a registry out there that if people need to, they can check the information against. So a, a fake card isn't gonna isn't gonna do anything. I am seeing more private groups, uh, including Berea College most recently, um, that are are mandating vaccines, though. So to folks out there that are just casual, there may be some things in the future pushed by the private sector uh, that you have to get vaccinated to to do. That's not us and government, uh, but that's going to be really natural in uh, in in um, especially the the private sector, as they have to balance and and weigh risks of of things they do. It looks like international travel is going to fall in that as well. John Boyle from WFPL. Hi, Governor. Um, 
wanted to uh, go back. You just mentioned something about uh, the college vaccinations, and uh, we were curious to know with such a high proportion of cases among young people right now, if you would um, consider a mandate for students at public universities. And then for a second question, uh, are there any plans to publish cases and deaths uh, by zip code at this point? Hmm. Um, I think we've published de deaths by county, uh, which right now is 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 a pretty granular uh, level. And we'd have to look at the extra amount of, of of work that may or may not be required. If we right now we we can publish them by um, uh, demographic data, which we do, um, and by county as well, and by age, um, which is which is a lot of data. There are some limits in in what we can do. Um, we'd have to look at the what what that would potentially take people um, uh, off of. And I'm sorry, the other question again. Oh, uh, so so I think our universities need to look. Uh, carefully and make their own decisions. Certainly one uh, factor has to be that if they have student housing and how uh, condensed is that student housing? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, UK, I know had a, had a good program where they would remove people who tested positive from student housing. Um, if there's not going to be a high level of vaccinations when people get back on campus in the fall, there's going to be a ton of testing that's going to ultimately be required. So, you know, if you're if you're a college student and and you don't want to have um, a Q-tip up your nose, uh, you know, with with a lot of frequency, uh, these safe and effective vaccines are are a pretty good alternative to that. Um, and right now, these variants are are impacting you. But I, I think it's something each university will have to look at. And if they make the decision they're going to go there, uh, we'll support them. Chris Otts from WDRB. Thank you, Governor. Um, I have uh, one question about vaccines, two on unemployment. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, on the uh, the announcement that you made today, I just want to be clear. I'm sorry if I didn't follow this, but before I believe you had said 2.5 million uh, having their first dose would be the prerequisite to fully reopening. Are you moving off of that uh, sort of line in the sand that you've established before uh, today or or still holding firm that that's what would need to happen, including the kids 12 to 15, I guess, uh, before removing all restrictions. Then on unemployment, how many people have re-registered their accounts as of uh, the most recently available day? And then a bigger picture question, you know, according to the information that the Labor Cabinet has provided, um, there are different ways to measure it, but there's still a significant backlog of unemployment claims. We're coming up on almost a year since uh, you said the goal was to get caught up on unemployment claims. Uh, is that still the goal? Are you still uh, trying uh, to do that? Is it attainable? with the system and you know if so what are you doing um to finally reach that goal thank you i'll turn most of the unemployment questions over to amy but certainly my goal is to serve everybody uh that has a valid claim you know we come across a, a number that unfortunately don't qualify uh under under federal law and and that's you know that that that's a tough piece but we want we want to try to serve uh everybody yes we have an antiquated system where it's really hard to get through the fraudulent or the others to to the uh, to the valid claims. Uh, yes, we have fewer people than we should, and the legislature still didn't provide funding to make a a personnel fix long term. We're having to make up for having regional offices closed in the past. Uh, budgets sliced, and that IT system uh, never improved. But you know, listen, my my goal is to help everybody. Uh, that needs it. On the 2.5 million, we've always talked about being willing to ease restrictions. What I think, uh, as long as the, the science continues to point that way, as long as we continue to see uh, good control of our case and our positivity rate, as long as uh, things in the nation overall are going well, and we can successfully get through the school year, um, can we can we reach 100% capacity uh, for uh, 
uh, events venues a thousand uh, or or lower before we hit 2.5? Yes, uh, I think we can. Uh, but we got to get through that school year, and that's when we're getting to 75 percent, and we we got to see where we're going from there. Uh, certainly, I think once it opens to 12 year olds and up, there's a whole new group that is eligible, and we ought to be able to reach the 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 12 point. I mean, the 2.5 at at that point, and ultimately we ought to we ought to surpass it at some point. Amy? We've had a little bit over 125,000 um, claimants able to re-register on the site. Um, we are still taking pen reset calls at 502-564-2900. But um, at this point, that number has um, greatly reduced from what it was. So we believe that the majority of people who needed to re-register have been able to do that by now. And then just quickly adding to what the governor said about the backlog, um, just as we've said before, it's not like there is a bucket that is cut off and then you take everyone out. There is continually new claims going in. So the vast majority of our pending claims are from the past three to six months. Um, our lingering claims are ones that have interstate issues. And so you're always going to have in the unemployment insurance world um, a certain number of just lingering claims. You're never going to have zero. So that's just not how the system works. Right now, our pending is at about 7%, which is actually about on a par of what it would have been pre-pandemic. So though we want to get to everybody and, and are going to get to everyone in that line, you're never going to have um, pending claims of zero. It's just not ever how the system is going to play itself out. All right, two more. Andrea Ash from WHAS. Hi, thanks, Governor. Um, so these are also on unemployment. Um, we have received several calls and emails from people who have had in person appointments for unemployment, sometimes even twice. And they were told their claims are fixed, but they're still unable and waiting for payment. Is there some sort of glitch in the system or um, what do you, what advice do you have for them? What should they do now? Should they make another appointment? I um, mean, th then the second question, great news on the sales tax. Revenue. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, great news on the sales tax revenue it seems like there is kind of momentum bouncing back from, um, at least on the economic side. We are also seeing like a bunch of now hiring signs, but many of those jobs are still lower paying and a lot of industries are um, slower to bounce back. And then I think Amy talked a little bit about this, but are people, I know with the reinstatement of the jo job search requirement, are people still expected to search for those jobs and then it, at what point are they going to be required to accept lower paying jobs, lower than the funds they would um, get from unemployment? Okay. On, um, on, on, first of all, on the, uh, on the hiring side, uh, we are seeing uh, companies hiring um, in, in all sectors of the economy at higher wage jobs, uh, at, at somewhat lower wage jobs. What we are seeing is the pressure is pushing up lower wage jobs uh, to pay more than they have in the past. And I think it's making us re-examine uh, how much we pay people in our society. You know, there's different sectors of our economy that are struggling to get people back where sometimes people who work in them live in poverty. And there's gonna be more opportunity for those individuals that in the past have worked really hard but haven't made much money with other employers out there that are paying more. So again, we got to think about uh, living wages uh, where people can support their, their families and not fall further and further into debt while they are working uh, harder and harder. Um, Amy, you want to get the unemployment piece? On the in-person appointments, it's it's hard to know, obviously, without um, 
knowing what the circumstances are for the individual claimants. But I would suggest you try calling the call center that is now up. So if a person has already been seen a couple of times, I would you know try to call that call center and see if you can get some help there. As far as the job search, when you would have to expand, it truly is a facts and circumstances test. It's There's no bright line that if you've searched for six weeks and can't find a job that is at the exact same pay because there's also geographic factors to take in account and you know, the factors as far as your education and sector. So that's something the unemployment insurance office works with you on. So I can't tell you that there's any particular line where you have to suddenly take a much lower paying job in order to qualify with the job search requirement. And, and just one addition, Andrea, if you would email us the information on those two individuals, if there's a glitch, we want to know about it as much as as anybody let us look into that two appointments thing ought to be fixed or people ought to know why there is a, a continuing issue no question uh, we'd like to run that down so we can be sure that there isn't uh, a glitch and and then once we run that down um, we'll, we'll report back to you too uh, joe ragusa from spectrum thanks for hanging on you are our final question of the day it's all good. Um, I do have two questions. I'll get the the, the simple one out of the way first. Uh, as we're talking about capacity restrictions being eased, I was wondering where we're at with the mask mandate as it kind of relates to to all of that, uh, you know, indoor events, outdoor events, that sort of thing. Um, and the other question, uh, comments you made on Monday, you know, talking kind of about people who are out pushing for reopening, you wanted them to encourage people to get the vaccine. You know, that received some pushback from people who have been out kind of pushing for reopening. I know Ryan Quarles has talked about uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine and encouraging people to get vaccines at his stops. Senator Rand Paul has talked about the effectiveness of the vaccine and, and kind of encouraging people to get it as well, though they've been fairly careful to be specific about how it's a personal choice and how it shouldn't be mandated or anything like that. But my, my question about that is, do you have any specific issue with you know, people who are advocating for reopening, their messaging around the vaccine and getting the vaccine. Well, all I'm asking is that when you're out, every stop, talk to people about getting the vaccine. It could save their lives. You know, not once, not twice. We try to do this every single day. And if we can just get every public official every day um, uh, uh, pushing uh, these vaccines as, as hard as they can because of their efficacy, It'll be really helpful. Let me give a compliment. Senator McConnell is very direct uh, about uh, how positive these vaccines are, and he talks about it in just ev about every stop he 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 makes. Uh, that's different uh, than some others. And I don't want to get into back and forth, and I don't want to give anybody uh, uh, oxygen, and I'm not trying to feud with anybody. I just want help. I mean, we just need help from... Uh, folks that especially that are part of, of, of a demographic that may be more hesitant to get a vaccine. And again, spending the majority of your time doing that, making personal appeals can save lives. I'd rather, I mean, I, I would trade saving, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of lives and being governor. I mean, it's just the moral and the right thing to, to do. And so all I'm asking is, is let's not dispute the science um, let, let's not let's not try to try to stop efforts that at times that we're keeping us safe. Let's just get people vaccinated, and we can be done. And we can be fully and entirely done. You know, these are smart people. They know how effective they are, and they also know that they can be powerful messengers if they'll just spend the time to 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 do so. Uh, again, I mentioned one good example, um, and um, and and we hope that 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 continues. Um, as far as the mask mandate, um, outside events under a thousand people, uh, we've lifted the mask mandate. Outside events with more than a thousand people, you need to be wearing uh, your mask. Small gatherings where everybody is vaccinated, we've lifted the mask mandate. That's both private gatherings and business gatherings. Again, small and 100% of people uh, vaccinated. All right, everybody. Um, I know there's one more day in the week, and it, and it seems like it's been a, an interesting week. Listen, when you look at where we are as a state, you ought to be really proud. Now, you're going to hear lots of things because that's where our world is right now, and that's what makes news. But I'm proud of you. 
some of the lowest deaths per capita in the country, lower than all but one of our neighboring states, uh, doing a, a good job in trying to keep cases down. First state to vaccinate uh, its teachers, proud that we got our kids back in school and we wanna keep them there. And we have an economy that is roaring back. Again, Fitch is recognizing us and not others, us for, for outstripping the national average on, on so many indicators. Uh, us uh, looking at um, a record uh, rainy day account because of an anticipated uh, surplus. Us with a record uh, sales tax month in April and there is no better indicator in whether people feel like the state is open and they can spend their money than actually being out and spending uh, their money. Uh, so let's trade in facts. Let's make sure we're still protecting each other as we're done. I'm itching just as much as everybody else to be totally done with all of it. There are still people that are counting on us um, to, to, to make sure that we do this right. And the reason, we've had our success. Dealing with the virus and where our economy is going is we have never tried to be the first. We have always been uh, smart. Not the fastest, but the smartest. We've given people time. We've told them where we're going. We've eased in and we've eased out of, of these restrictions. We're going to continue to do so. We've come so far together. We're going to complete this. Uh, we're going to win. We're going to get back to our lives. We're going to process the grief we've been through, but then buckle up because our economy is going somewhere special. Uh, we'll see you uh, back on Monday. And starting next week, we'll be doing one COVID update, and that'll be on Mondays. And then we're looking at doing one other general update on other things going on in state government, other pieces of news. Uh, probably on a Thursday, we're still looking for the best time uh, to do that. So thank you all. Stay safe. Get vaccinated.